Our next speaker is Mr. John Coleman, the founder of the, of the Weather Channel, which, by the way, is a TV channel that my wife watches every day. Mr. Coleman began his career as a TV weatherman in Champaign, Peoria, in Chicago, Illinois, and later in Omaha, Nebraska, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and New York City. He was the original weather caster on what was then the brand new ABC Morning Network program, Good Morning America, and did this for seven years. He then founded the Weather Channel and served as, a C as the CEO and president during, the, during his first year. After serving with the Weather Channel, Mr. Coleman became the weather anchor for WCBS-TV in New York and later with WMAQ-TV in Chicago. He is currently living in Southern California and working with an independent television station, KUSI-TV in San Diego, which he finally calls his retirement job. Please welcome Mr. John Coleman. conference, and it was after that conference 
that the Global Warming Petition Project was launched, and before long, 31,478 American scientists, several of whom are with us today, had signed the petition. That included 9,029 with PhDs, people who were willing to step up in writing and debunk global warming. I began to feel like the guy in the Verizon commercial. <laughs> Al Gore, can you hear me now? <laughs> wow, Al, there's no scientific basis for your man-made global warming. There hasn't been any in the past, and there's no reason to fear any in the future. And I knew that there were a lot of reasons for that. One was that the accuracy and completeness of the worldwide data observation network was in serious disarray. Now, I knew that thermometers, when I was a kid, was a tumor mercury stapled onto a little wooden stick with a few numbers printed, and that was going to get us an accurate measurement of the temperature. And I also knew that we had 6,000 worldwide observation stations observing the weather in 1980, but by 2000, only 2,000 of those stations were left. There was skullduggery afoot, and the stations were disappearing. I saluted Anthony Watts, another meteorologist, who had formed servicestations.org, and found that nine out of 10 of the weather observation stations located in across the US do not meet the National Weather Service standards. Take the one in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. <laughs> the air conditioning compressor is next to the thermometer. If that's not good enough, let's go to Evelyn. And there, there's the thermometer. It's on that stand right there next to the waste water treatment plant. Well, that small town. <coughs> How about the big city thermometers? Well, here's one that's in the national network, one of the keys. It's out there at Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport, right between the runways. It's been there since the airport was built. They used to fly a few little planes out of there. Now jets are powering up with their huge heat exhaust. And you're telling me that's not affecting the temperature? Wow. So I thought I would tackle another key question. How did this man, Al Gore, get it so wrong? Now, he had written the book called Earth and Balance. I had read it. And from that, he had made his movie, An Inconvenient Truth. I watched it. And he had uh, made global warming a campaign issue. If he had not, it would not be so ingrained in American culture. The entire sci-fi frenzy that he had created swept the nation. And I wondered if I might tell that story of how Al Gore got it so wrong. Well, I got to tell that story on television. Now, I believe in balanced journalism. So here's the way that happened when Al Gore came to my current hometown of San Diego to get an award. Former Vice President Al Gore was honored tonight at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He was given an award in recognition of his environmental work. KUSI's Tom Jordan is live in La Jolla with more on that. Tom? Paul, Al Gore was the first ever recipient of the Roger Revelle Prize here at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, honored tonight for his work in environmental preservation. <laughs> A rousing welcome for a man continuing his campaign on environmental awareness and protection. Former Vice President Al Gore being honored for his efforts with the first ever Roger Revelle Prize. I want to uh, express my very deep and genuine gratitude uh, for this honor. The award presented at this dinner marking the 100th birthday of the late Roger Revelle, who headed Scripps Institution of Oceanography from 1950 to 1964. Gore studied under Revelle at Harvard University in the 1960s and credits him for igniting his passion on the environment. As a, a, a former student, still a student, trying to learn, but still inspired by a great teacher who was a great scientist and a great man. Roger Revelle's work back in the 1960s was at the time considered 
revolutionary. Today, many scientists consider that work almost prophetic. And at that time, we wrote a short report, and we were told it was a very short report, saying that climate change is becoming an issue, the Earth is heating up, and therefore, something needs to be done about that. Al Gore says he was deeply moved by Ravel's early work. He now considered it at the forefront of the global warming movement. A Nobel Peace Prize winner and Oscar-winning documentarian, all from his work on the environment. Now he adds a new distinguished and personal honor to that list. And I am deeply, deeply grateful. And tonight's celebration was part of three days of celebrating the life of Roger Revelle. Roger Revelle would have been 100 years old tomorrow. We are live in La Jolla. I'm Tom Jordan, KUSI News. Thanks, Tom. John Coleman believes there is no significant man-made global warming, and he travels the nation speaking of the topic. John has some insights now on Roger Revelle's scientific research and the effect that it had on Al Gore. John? Well, Revelle was a powerful man, a Nobel scientist, and a significant force here in San Diego in the 1950s. There's no doubt that he's largely responsible for the high status of descriptions of the oceanography in its field and for locating the University of California in San Diego, the UCSD, at La Jolla. While serving as director of Scripps, Ravel and one of his researchers wrote the first modern scientific paper that linked carbon dioxide released in the air from the burning of fossil fuels and the greenhouse effect and the warming of temperatures. Well, this triggered an avalanche of research that eventually became the impetus behind the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the entire global warming movement. In the 1960s, Ravel moved to Harvard to establish a center for population studies. This is where Professor Ravel encountered student Albert Gore. He involved Gore and his classmates in the tabulating data from a carbon dioxide study. Gore was so impressed, he wrote about it in his 1992 book, Earth in the Balance. That became the story for the movie An Inconvenient Truth, the Oscar and the Nobel Peace Prize. And some people say $100 million all came from that. There is no doubt Roger Revelle had a major impact on Vice President Gore's life. But there's a twist. In 1988, Roger Revelle was having second thoughts about whether carbon dioxide was the same. Was a significant greenhouse gas. He wrote letters to two congressmen about it. And in 1991, he co-authored a report with the new science magazine Cosmos in which he expressed his strong doubts about global warming and urged more research before any remedial action was taken. At that point, Mr. Gore pronounced Ravel semi and <laughs> he continues to refuse the debate. Many offers of thousands of dollars have been made for debate. He refuses. Today, Gore sequestered the media at this event and he set forth rules, no questions, no interviews. I have learned that in 1991, Roger Revelle made what was his final speech at the high-powered, very private summer enclave of powerful men and politicians at the Bohemian Grove in Northern California. There he apologized for his research, for sending so many people in the wrong direction on global warming, and he worried about the political fallout from the UNIPCC and Al Gore. A man named Don Michael Schmidtman, who lives in the San Francisco area, was there that day. And he remembers the Ravel speech very well. He has told me about it in some detail. So think of the irony. Today, Al Gore received the first Roger Ravel Award, honoring the man who sent him on his global warming campaign. But Ravel had realized that it was a false alarm and that the science was flawed before he died. Ravel died of a heart attack in 1991. It would be interesting to know that if he had lived, would he be approving of the award that was given tonight? Or perhaps would he be joining me at the International Conference of Global Warming Skeptics in New York next week? If you want to read the article on global warming that I have written, you can go to KUSI.com, click on Coleman's Corner. Paul, um, this is really come. interesting. We haven't heard this information at all before. Well, I've done a lot of digging over the last year to uh, find all of this. And it really fascinated me when I stumbled across the Bohemian Grove speech. It's not documented anymore. This is uh, the first time your orbits have crossed, you and Al Gore. They, you're both in the same city for 24 hours, and 
couldn't get the two of you to meet. Well, well, well let me speak about the person. He's a former vice president. He's a man who got 52 million votes for president, served very honorably as a politician. I think he would have a little regard for me. But you'd like to debate him, wouldn't you? Well, sure, I'd love to debate him. But you understand, this isn't political. I'm a journalist and a meteorologist. My interest is strictly in the science. Thank you. So it turned out that <laughs> CO2 being a so-called greenhouse gas from Roger Revelle, and Revelle, a noted scientist, a powerful man, showed true character, uh, the mark of a great scientist. When his theory went bad, he faced up to it, and he said he was wrong. And did you know, I think most of you probably do, that a British court has found nine major scientific errors in Gore's film despite the fact he continues in denial. A hundred million dollars he's made from global warming, and he'll make billions from cap and trade. And he's, of course, a key senior statesman in his party. Well, that doesn't explain everything about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, so let me do a moment on it. We've vacillated on planet Earth. This is four and a half billion years. The history of Earth, as paleoclimatologists have determined it is from ice cores and other evidence, Interglacial periods, ice ages, interglacial period, ice age, interglacial period, ice age. Here's our current interglacial period. What's an interglacial period? That is nature's global warming. That's all. And this chart shows the temperatures have been rising gradually ever since the ice age ended 12,000 years ago. Look at the chart. Here's the ice age ending, and there are the temperatures since. And we've had warm spells and cold spells, despite what's happened. And then you look at this very last bump on the chart. Way down there. That's the period during which mankind has been burning fossil fuels. I'll come up to the period starting in 1980 and running up to the present. The IPPC says those rises are a result of the carbon dioxide from our fossil fuels. Well, we skeptics point out that these temperatures are just rising as they would during an interglacial period in a normal way, nothing exceptional taking place. And we even point out, as Dr. Singer did, that fossil fuels and CO2 were increasing during the period from about 1940 until the period of about 1970, but the temperatures actually stayed steady during that period. Here's the use of fossil fuels building from around 1700 up until the year 2001. And here are the temperatures in blue uh, from that period as measured by satellites and other uh, sources that we have had. And I'm not claiming our temperature record's perfect. I have superimposed sunspots over the temperatures to show that there's a strong correlation between the activity on the sun and temperatures on Earth and there doesn't seem to be any real correlation to the use of hydrogen fuels or carbon-based fuels. Here in the box are the observed data of temperatures, and the rise toward the end of this box certainly coincides with the projections of the IPCC models when they began, and then they said it would continue. And here is CO2 in green continuing to rise from 2002 to 2008 up into 2009. And here in the blue line, uh, the temperatures are diminishing. And the uh, satellite data, which I think is probably the best data, is in the pink line. And it diminishes the greatest. So you can see that, in fact, even though CO2 is rising and the IPCC projections says that it will be the temperatures should be rising fast, that in fact temperatures are falling, and to me, that's it. There's so, we're so out of step between the temperatures and the projections from the computer models there in the pink bands that, that I just don't think there's any validity at all to this holy grail of the radiative forcing formula. And when I sat down with the only person from the IPPC climate modelers who ever agreed to sit down with me. He was absolutely arrogant. He said, 
I suppose you don't even know from memory what the formula is to bring up the force. He, he felt that was his holy grail. Well, his holy grail, dear holiness, has faith. It is dead, it is kaput, it is finny, R-I-P-I-P-C-C, and how, what do I think about it? Well, I feel good! <laughs> and I blame it all on the sun. When the sun is active and the sunspots are plentiful, it is pretty clear the temperatures on Earth are warming, and when the sun is quiet, <coughs> the temperatures on Earth are cooling. Do you know that we're in the 33rd consecutive day of not a single sunspot on planet Earth after the uh, most spotless year in a hundred years? And it is pretty clear that this new cycle is weak in starting and probably will be slow. So it appears there's no evidence whatsoever to support radiative forcing. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever to support other than the consensus vote of a bunch of people with agendas uh, to support the concept that we must reduce our carbon footprints. So I think we can have it all. <coughs> we can drive cars, fly in airplanes, have our computers, our cell phones, our iPods. We can heat and cool our homes. We can watch our television sets. Yes, we can even have all those lights in crazy Las Vegas. While the environmentalists want us to return to the jungle like Tarzan and Jane, and Jane does look kind of cute, what would we do about lunch? Would the gorilla eat us, or would we find a way to kill the gorilla? Your carbon footprint is not producing global warming, ladies and gentlemen. The only evidence that I can find in all my searching I display for you now, <laughs> and I believe that this evidence merits more research. Than I